I'm based at the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and there's this giant quantum community and all these different quantum institutes and things in Maryland. So um, there are some other affiliations there. And if you need to reach me, you can via the address. This lecture, this first lecture, is going to be more of an overview of a lot of sorts of material and kind of a gentle introduction to quantum thermodynamics. And instead of starting with the definition of quantum thermodynamics, which I do want to get to, I want to start with a simple story that demonstrates how information can be useful in a thermodynamic task. Because the kind of new breed of quantum thermodynamics that has thrived over the past decade plus has come from combining thermodynamics with quantum information. So here's a motivation for the information theoretic. We have a simple story about how information can be useful in a thermodynamic task. Here's our setup. We have the favorite toy system of physicists everywhere, a gas in a box. This gas is going to be a really, really simple gas. It consists of only one particle. And we're going to suppose at first that it's plausible. In a later lecture, I'm going to move to various types of quantum systems. But we'll start with a plausible gas for simplicity. It exchanges heat through the walls of its container with an environment that's at some fixed temperature. T. Here's the protocol. We can slide a partition into the box of center and then measure whether the particle is on the left-hand side of the box or the right-hand side of the box. There are two alternatives here. So the information that we gain is one bit of information. And suppose that the answer is the particles on the right hand side of the box. We can tie a rope to the partition. And let's see how well I can draw this. Use some pulleys to tie. an anvil to the rope, just in some heavy objects. Then we can unfix this partition so that it can slide back and forth. And this particle is going to hit the partition, since it's a gas moving around right now. It's going to keep punching the partition until the partition reaches the other side of the box. Points because the rope is attached, our anvil will have moved up. So you can draw this in the optimal place, but you can imagine this anvil is going to move up. Let's analyze exactly what's going on here. And since we move the anvil upward, the anvil gains gravitational potential energy. And so in other words, we've performed work on the end. Performing work is a thermodynamic task. We can calculate in our very idealized scenario how much work we can perform, at least on average in an ideal situation.
In this work, because of how the gas is expanding, is pressure volume type work. So W equals an integral of P times pressure times the differential volume elements. We integrate from some initial volume to some final volume. And we all remember the ideal gas law in high school. It says that the pressure times the volume equals the number of particles times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature of the gas. The gas is always an equilibrium with its fixed temperature and height. So in our very simple idealized scenario, number of particles is one. We can solve for the pressure in terms of the volume. Pressure equals Boltzmann's constant times the temperature over the volume. And then we can substitute back into our integral. So the work performs with an integral with Boltzmann's constant times the temperature over the volume times our differential element. And I'm going to integrate from V over two to V because the particle begins confined to half the box, but ends up being able to be anywhere in the entire box. So we integrate primes here and we evaluate the limits. We find that the work we can perform ideally on average is Boltzmann's constant times temperature times log T. And you will see this factor all over the place in quantum thermodynamics and information periodic thermodynamics generally. Where did this energy come from? By the first law of thermodynamics, if we did work, we need to compensate for it somehow. So, where did the energy come from? Anybody? Kinetic energy of particle. Kinetic energy of particle. Yes, that's that's directly where it came from. Um, where kind of ultimately, at the beginning of the story, did that energy come from? So the particles. Go ahead. The measurements. The measurements. You mean where the particle is? Yeah. Well, if our system is a classical system, uh, so that measurements and disturbing the particle will be very relevant when we talk about a quantum particle. For now, the particle is classical, so we can suppose that when we measure it, we when we measure it, we don't disturb it. Uh, the back, yes. In other words, for heat, the heat is random energy. It's disordered. It's not directly useful for pushing something in one direction. In other words, on the other hand, work is coordinated energy. It's uh, directed is directly useful. In other words, we took a kind of, kind of useless piece and turned it into coordinated work. How did we do that? We used up our bit of information. But first, we know the, where the particle is and which half the box. But at the end of the protocol, we have no idea where the particle is because it can be anywhere throughout the entire box. So we traded our information for work. Or if we have information, we can use it to turn heat into work. Later, in another lecture, when we're talking about quantum versions of this protocol, we will show also that the arrow can point in the opposite direction. And if we start out with work, then we can use it to gain information. So this is supposed to be a taste of why we might want to combine thermodynamics with information theory and so quantum information theory. And again, we'll get into more quantum aspects of this story later. This story was established by 1929. 
Hi, Leo, yes, you are. In this publication. The Szilard was a great Hungarian American physicist. He did oh, lots of really amazing work in addition to thinking about the relationship between energy and information. And in fact, this story, which now is again all over the quantum thermodynamics literature, um, grew out of Szilard's PhD thesis, which was praised by Einstein. So for those of you here who are PhD students, may that be inspiration for you for your PhD thesis. They put together similarly amazing PhD pieces that we'll talk about you know, a century into the future. Does anyone have questions at the moment about sea light? Yes. Uh, so the when you measure whether the part goes left or right hand side, that's when you put that in the middle. Like, oh, is that how you use the bin? Yes. Oh, you use it to determine which direction you hook up the oh. Any other questions? Okay. So I like to start with a simple motivating story, but now we should get into some logistics. Here's an outline of the lecture school. I didn't want to bore you by starting with it, but we started with sea light engine. Then we should introduce what quantum thermodynamics is since we are supposed to hear about it for a whole week. We'll hear about a lot of details, but I think it's useful at some point to go over definitions and foundations. I'll talk a little about the landscape of quantum thermal. From the lectures here, you will hear very different perspectives on quantum thermodynamics, and there are many different subfields of quantum thermodynamics. So I want to give some sense of how they fit together. And I'll give you a homework problem. Don't worry, it's a fun one. You can think about it and argue about it together when you're hiking. And then hopefully we'll have time to talk about quantum heat and work. The goal here is to illustrate how thermodynamics is really, really quite different from classical thermodynamics in some senses. Also, when it comes to logistics, I should provide some basic references for when you want to explore more. So two reviews about the kind of modern incarnation of quantum thermodynamics that grew up over the past decade plus came out in, well, they were published in 2016. Background on quantum thermodynamics has been done for many decades. It started in the 1930s um, and it underwent a few waves, but probably the most, um, the wave that has gotten the most traction and has really developed quantum thermodynamics into a, a broad international subfield oh, started up a little over a decade ago. And it has been very enhanced by quantum information theory. So these two reviews share a lot of that perspective. And the field has been moving extremely quickly over the past few years. Uh, these papers originally came out in 2015 on the archive. So a lot has happened since then, but they provide nice overviews. Um, if you find some topic in here that interests you, you might find more in-depth information in this book, Thermodynamics in the Quantum Regime. It was edited by, edited by Felix Binder and company, has contributions from many, many different researchers. And each chapter is about one topic in quantum thermodynamics that has been trending recently. Yeah. Just a quick question about the ideal gas law. So, pressures and volumes and temperatures and stuff defined in the first setting, but then when you have all the objects, kind of numbers and particles. 
but did it talk? Are you going to talk a little bit about taking n equals one in that? It's a great derivation, but are you going to talk about the utility of that in the n equals one limit? Yeah, it might very well not be very justified in the n equals one limit. I think of this story as kind of the simplest version we can present. If we want the more realistic version, then we can think about um, many particle gaps. We can measure instead which side has more particles in it. Then just the, the, the calculations will get a little more complicated. Um, or alternatively, we could say, so we have this a one particle gas, but imagine we run lots and lots and lots of trials. On average, it will be as though we had a many particle gas. So I agree with you that taking the n equals one limit is suspicious in that calculation. Do it just because it's kind of the simplest version, and we can um, we can definitely complain about it, and but also to make these adjustments. Yes, it's not really suspicious to use n equal one because the point of the ideal gas with the particle doesn't interact, and the contribution from each particle is the same. So really, what you what happens when you say that there is one is there will be fluctuations, but like it is an absolutely correct statement that the same endeavor to do that. It, that kind of gets into the homework problem. So it, we can probably we can also talk about that some more when we're discussing the homework problem. No, I'm just saying that the fact that using n n equals one is fine is kind of the definition of the idea. Yeah, I, I I think that it's it's a very good point to discuss. Um, and uh, it's it's related to the homework problem. So maybe we can have a fuller discussion of it um, when we get there. Um, but yes, it's also kind of related to this sense that you can kind of you know, run the engine with one particle and then average over trials. And it's as though you had an ideal gas with a whole bunch of particles. There's one more reference I'll mention. Oh, I published a book two years ago. Not a textbook, it's supposed to be more directly fun, I suppose. Uh, it has a broad overview of the field, the history, um, many different subfields of quantum thermodynamics, major results, and it emphasizes the basic physics. So it's written in the style of a conversation that we would have over lunch if we didn't have napkins to write calculations on. Oh, and if you want to order directly through the press, then you can get a 30% discount. Yes, so I think that's it. Another sort of resource is there is a um, big annual conference for this kind of information here at Read of Quantum Thermodynamics. That happens every year. It's called QTD. It's going to happen at the University of Maryland this year in August. Here's the website. It's qtd2024.umd.edu. And the deadline for submitting abstracts is March 1st. So it would be great to see some of you there. All right. What, as a whole, is quantum thermodynamics. First of all, what is thermodynamics? Does anyone remember the definition of thermodynamics? I, I tend to ask this question of physicists a lot, and um, I had to look up the definition when I was writing this book. I also ask it of people who say they specialize in thermodynamic phenomena and they usually don't know the definition, but anyone have a guess? Yes. Uh, the phenomenological study of work. That is phenomenological. Um, work and heat are very core concepts in thermodynamics. Uh, work and heat are both energy. So we could say broadly, thermodynamics is about energy. You cool? Yes. Okay. If we get your help here, sure. it may well be that um, you're not being seen by Al because there is a background. Because if you show up every once in a while, you can remove the background, perhaps.
All right, there you go. Excellent. There are, as was pointed out, different forms that energy can be in. So we study those forms and the transformations amongst them. Thermodynamics were born during the Industrial Revolution. Thomas Savory invented the steam engine in 1698. Thomas Newcomen invented more or less the same thing, but a slightly better version in 1712. And then James Watt created a version that was really useful. So people, particularly in England, used the steam engine to pump water out of mines and then to power factories. So naturally, people started wondering how efficiently engines could work. So they developed the theory of thermodynamics with a practical perspective inspired by a transformative technology of the day. Uh, this theory was uh, engendered because of inspiration by large classical systems like steam engines. And although the steam engines aren't typically at equilibrium, a lot of the theories focuses on equilibrium. Uh, today's technologies include small systems, quantum systems, and information processing systems. So we need to reimagine thermodynamics for the 21st century. And in large part, nowadays, people are doing that using the toolkit of quantum information theory. Well, I guess I mean two things. First, the study of uh, how we can use quantum phenomena to process information as we cannot if we have only fossil resources. By process information, I mean solve computational problems, communicate information, store information, and secure information. By quantum phenomena, I mean entanglement, discreteness of spectra, measurement disturbance, even other things like contextuality and spin statistics. This is kind of more an applied perspective. So quantum information theory, like thermodynamics, has an applied perspective and a fundamental perspective. Fundamentally, we see quantum information theory as the understanding of quantum systems through how they store and process information. For instance, now they we understand quantum many body thermalization in part through entanglement. So how do thermodynamics and quantum information theory come together? Why would it make sense to apply one to the other, apart from the motivating story we saw earlier? Well, they're both operational. An operational theory is one that focuses on an agent who has certain needs, certain resources, and tries to perform certain tasks as efficiently as possible. And we calculate those efficient efficiencies. For instance, in thermodynamics, operational tasks include charging batteries, powering factories, and cooling systems. Whereas in quantum information theory, operational tasks include uh, communi communicating information over noisy channels, cryptographically securing information, and so on. Um, in contrast, oh. Statistical mechanics is not such an operational theory. I think that's one division between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics, we mainly calculate partition functions. And another important link between the two is the importance of entropies. By which I mean functions of probability distributions or quantum states uh, that can quantify the uncertainty about the outcome of the measurements of the states or the value of a random variable distributed according to the distribution. These quantify the operate, 
quantify the optimal efficiencies of these operational tasks. So we'll probably see entropies from a number of people during the week, and most especially from Nellie Day. Suppose that you go off and say you want to do quantum thermodynamics. Well, what do we do within quantum thermodynamics? What are the guiding questions? I see there as being three. First, we inherited laws of thermodynamics from the 1800s from the realm of large classical systems. So how can we extend them? How can basic thermodynamic laws extend to explicitly to small quantum and information processing systems? This is part of the fundamental part of thermodynamics. A more operational or applied element of quantum thermodynamics treats how we can use non classical resources to enhance thermodynamic tasks. We know from quantum information processing that we can use, say, entanglement to solve some computational problems particularly quickly. Similarly, we might expect to use entanglement or other quantum resources in order to enhance the charging of batteries, the powering of machines, and so on. Finally, suppose that we have some system that is exchanging energy and other thermodynamic quantities we can ask which of its behaviors it can realize only if it's quantum, not if it's classical. So, which thermodynamic behaviors are truly non classical? I've been talking about how we can use quantum information theory to update thermodynamics. But here we can go in the opposite direction. Here we can use thermodynamics to understand better what separates the classical world from the classical world. Does anyone have questions about what quantum thermodynamics is? Specifically, non equilibrium quantum. So it does involve statistical mechanics, right? One would not. Try to calculate partition functions. So we can ask generally what's the difference between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics? You'll get different answers. An answer that I've heard is if something involves probability distributions or density operators, it's statistical mechanics. If it doesn't, then it's thermodynamics. Personally, I don't ascribe to that view. Um, and we use a lot of density operators in quantum thermodynamics. I see thermodynamics as differing from statistical mechanics in this operational perspective. So if we're talking about work and heat and engines and machines and what an agent can achieve, then I'd say we're doing thermodynamics, even if we're talking about partition functions and yes, sometimes calculating partition functions. Any other questions? Okay, then. Briefly, I'd like to overview the landscape of quantum thermodynamics so that when we see all these different perspectives from different lectures this week, we're not wondering how, how are these possibly unified? How can we have one winter school about all these different perspectives? I like to think of quantum thermodynamics as a map that has different city states and principalities and kingdoms and republics. 
There are lots of different sub communities which have their own toolkits and main results. And you know, for a guidebook, we point to chapters four through six of my book. It's all about this overview, or excuse me, six through 14. So, one city state is that of quantum thermal machines. Ronnie Kosloff is going to talk about these. We, when using cars, use engines that run cycles, usually an auto cycle, unless you're using an electric car nowadays. And usually we think about a gas undergoing one of these cycles. Can we even define one of these for a quantum system? And beyond that, we use quantum phenomena to enhance these cycles so that they perform better if they're quantum rather than classical. Also beyond engines, we can think about Oh, engine, uh, refrigerators, ratchets, batteries, and so various thermodynamic machines. Another city state is that of thermodynamic resource theories. Nellie Eng will talk about these. A resource theory is a simple model developed in quantum information theory for any situation in which the systems we can access and the operations we can perform are constrained. And thermodynamics often we're constrained by having an environment that a fixed temperature and the first law of thermodynamics constrains us to conserve energy. So here, we use entropies a lot. Um, this is a good setting for when you want to reason about small systems, things outside the thermodynamic limits, non-equilibrium systems, and we can derive strengthenings of the second law. Another field of so Quantum thermodynamics. Here the idea is if we have small systems, then, well, even if we have large systems, the amount of work or heat that will be exchanged during a protocol will vary from trial to trial because even materials consist of tiny particles that behave randomly and sometimes don't move quite as expected. But if the systems are small, then the fluctuations in the statistics of heat and work exchanged and so on can be comparable to the average. So the fluctuations become very important. So Gabriel Lendi and Kanusi Ha will be talking about stochastic quantum thermodynamics. And these um, stochastic thermodynamics in general can be applied to things like molecular motors that operate in biological cells. Um, one topic near and dear to my heart is this of uh, applications of quantum thermodynamics. I guess I should show this really at the boundary of the map. Applica applications of quantum thermodynamics across science. We've been using quantum information theory to update thermodynamics. We can also use quantum thermodynamics as a toolkit to gain a new lens onto chemistry, black hole physics, atomic molecular and optical physics, mass matter, and so on. And we can also use some of their platforms to realize some of the theory in quantum thermodynamics. And Ferdinand Schmidt-Coller and Jaren uh, Dack will be talking about this. And we don't have time to visit all of the city seats, but uh, here is just a glimpse of the ones that we'll visit this week. Does anybody have questions about that? I kind of have a question about the previous moment when you asked if anyone had questions. Okay. So there is a rather tricky bit about when you say extends to small and quantum. Some quantum effects like a discrete, like discrete energy states. Are not particularly quantum in the sense that they're perfectly fine with the normal physical mechanics. Agreed. So I kind of feel that we need a better definition of what it is that quantum thermodynamic settings, because it's not, not just anything that's small. Actually, I do incorporate the study of small systems that are quasi classical in quantum thermodynamics. So by quasi-classical, one can mean, for example, a system that has discrete energy levels, but say doesn't have uh, isn't in a state that has coherences relative to their energy level, those energy eigenstates, um, or doesn't experience entanglement, something like that. 
There are a whole lot of phenomena that one can think of as quantum because they characterize quantum systems. Uh, but in fact, classical systems can realize some of those um, or can approximate some of those. And discrete energy levels is one of those characteristics that can be approximated very well or realized with classical systems. Um, but there are a bunch of approaches. So one is, suppose that we, uh, here was, here's what happened in the context of thermodynamic resource theories. Um, results were derived first for quasi-classical systems that had discrete energy levels, uh, but no coherences in their states. Uh, that was rather tricky to figure out. Um, once those results were in place, then people could add in, could, could derive results about coherences. And so the quasi-classical system was an important step on the way to a more fully quantum theory. So that's a reason why I think about quasi-classical results as within quantum thermodynamics. Um, if you want to be really, really, really rigorous about what's, and I, I also try to be careful about the difference between quantumness and non-classicality. Um, so I would say that a whole lot within quantum thermodynamics involves merely quantum characteristics, which includes discrete energy levels, which can also be realized by classical systems. But I think it is very important under question C here to think about which of the characteristics of, or which thermodynamic behaviors are truly non-classical, can be realized by no classical system whatsoever. And um, my bar for non-classicality is contextuality. But that's a whole lot of the conversation. Does that make sense? Well, I think the point that can be taken away is that we need a better definition of quantum in a sense. So what definition or, you use, I think is up to you, depending on what you want to do. Like if you're here trying to answer this question, I think that um, contextuality and non-classicality are good definitions. Um, if you're trying to uh, just see, you know, is it possible to make a quantum system that will run some sort of engine cycle? Maybe, uh, maybe discreteness of spectra is okay. It's, it's technically quantum, like literally according to the word, uh, quantum is meaning discrete packets. Um, but then you can also go beyond that and say, suppose that I have coherences, which is kind of more quantum, uh, a little less functional, although classical waves, of course, can have coherence, and ask what that can buy you, and then you can go farther and ask about entanglement. Um, so I definitely encourage thinking hard about what you mean by quantumness and uh, being specific about the definition that is right for you and your problem. Any other questions? Yes. I have to say this this is kind of super important because a lot of things are claimed to be quantum and they are and especially in quantum developments there's a misuse of it sometimes and uh, um, yeah I just wanted to be as you said super careful about this and um, also maybe me I could have cut a couple of quantum my papers sometimes and I say that I'm just thinking but um, yeah. But that, that happens a lot, unfortunately. And if, for instance, you're looking for a reference for, uh, say, work about um, features that are quantum to some extent um, or extremely non classical, kind of what the spectrum is and a list of those, uh, those characteristics, um, I would suggest looking into the work of Joe Emerson in Waterloo because he has thought about that um, in extreme detail for a little while. Here's the homework problem. It's going to be kind of along the lines of Sular's engine. It's also going to be classical, but again, we're going to get to uh, quantum version later on. Here's the setup. We have a very tiny ratchet. And I'm very bad at drawing this ratchet, but I'll do my best. It's not terrible as it sometimes is. So it's a little wheel that has teeth sticking out, and it has some a spring mechanism so that if you wind the ratchets in one direction, then you have to do work on it, and you'll increase the potential energy of the spring. 
So ratchet will increasingly store potential energy. But ratchets can also unwind, in which case it loses potential energy. There's also a call, which is this two sort of a thing. Uh, and it catches on uh, the arms of the ratchet. So if you can wind the ratchet such that the next arm comes to be beneath the pawl, then the pawl will prevent the ratchet from unwinding and will ensure that the ratchet stores potential energy. There's also a thermal bath. So this is an equilibrium with bath at a temperature T. And I claim the following. Bath is going to keep the ratchet. If the bath kicks in the unwinding direction, then this pole is going to catch on an arm and ensure that the ratchet doesn't actually unwind. So this direction is not possible. But if the bath peaks in the winding direction, then it has the potential to get another arm on the other side of the pole. The pole will catch. And so the ratchet will come to store more potential energy. So the ratchet, as uh, was pointed out in answer to an earlier question of mine about Steeler's engine, the ratchet takes heat from the heat bath and stores it as potential energy, or in other words, the potential to perform work in the future. There are many formulations in the second law of thermodynamics. One is the Kelvin Flop statement. That is, it is impossible to devise a cyclically operating device, the sole effect of which is to absorb energy in the form of heat from a single thermal reservoir and to deliver an equivalent amount of work. In other words, if we have only one thermal reservoir, then we cannot extract work. So what we need to find out here, one more question is, how the ratchet, how does the ratchet not break the second law of thermodynamics? I don't want for you to answer that question now. Um, also, if you have heard this story before, um, then don't tell anyone if you've heard the answer. Also, don't look this up online. Just think about it. When you're wandering around and exploring, just keep this in the back of your mind. So how do the ratchets and pull not, not violate the second law of thermodynamics? We'll talk about this at the beginning of my next section, which I believe is tomorrow. Now let's switch subjects and think about one way in which quantum thermodynamics differs from classical thermodynamics. Because of measurement disturbance and superpositions relative to energy eigenstates. So let's try to even figure out what it makes sense to think of as quantum work and peace. We 
probably remember the first law of thermodynamics. States that if you have a system whose internal energy changes, that change comes from the sum of the heat it absorbs and the work performed on it. Here's our problem. Suppose that we have now a quantum gap in box. Particles would really be necessarily well localized, but I can draw quantum gases only so well. This gas can exchange heat with the heat bath through the walls of the box. Again, that could be at some temperature. And also, I suppose that we have piston that caps the container. And we're using, we're pressing down the piston to perform work on the gas. We expect the gas to exchange heat with the heat bath and to exchange work with the piston. And the question is, how much heat and how much work? What is Q, what is W? So at each instant T, our gas is in some state, generally a quantum state rho of T, some density operator. This is not necessarily an energy eigenstate of the gas. And so the system doesn't necessarily have a well-defined energy. Is the Hamiltonian for the gas just p square root of m sum the world particles? Sorry? Is the Hamiltonian for the gas just p square root of m for all particles? Well, it could be that. You could add in interactions. Um, maybe the boundary conditions as something interesting. Kind of up to you. So if the energy at one instant isn't even well defined, then how do we define the change in energy across multiple instances? Um, you might say, well, we can calculate the expectation value of the energy. So we can take the trace of our state with, let's call the Amazonian at time t agency. Well, we could do that, but that's an average over many drives. And we might want to know how much heat and work are exchanged in just one trial. That seems kind of intuitive to ask for. Well, we could measure the energy. We can do that in every single trial or any one trial, but measuring the energy disturbs the energy. And measuring the energy can even change how much work and heat is being done on the system. So for these reasons, defining quantum work and heat is not trivial. It's one way in which quantum thermodynamics is a little less straightforward than classical. So many different definitions have been proposed. I think that they're useful in different situations, depending on how you can measure the gas, how you're poking the gas, whether you're a theorist or an experimentalist. And depending on how much time we have, I'll present a few examples, probably not all of them. But the list of the full list is in chapter six of my book. Yeah. 
Here are some example definitions. First, we can define work in terms of control parameters. And define heat in terms of the state. It seems kind of reasonable to ascribe to the system an average internal energy. Of this form. Let's call it U of T, and it'll be this expectation value that I wrote up earlier with the state and the normal speed. And we can differentiate each side using the chain rule. So time derivative of the internal energy is the sum of two terms. We have trace with states and the derivative of the Hamiltonian, as well as the trace with the derivative of the states and the Hamiltonian. Work is controlled energy. You perform work on a system by, say, changing the position of a piston and box, or adjusting the strength of a magnetic field, or in other words, tuning some control parameter in the Hamiltonian. So often we'll say that this first term is the work absorption rate. And that's the definition. Now, suppose that we have an ordinary classical thermodynamic system, or depending on your definition of the two, it's a physical mechanical system that's exchanging heat with the heat bath. So that the system will tend to flow toward equilibrium. This system's state is described by some some probability density over phase space. And that probability density, if just heat is exchanged, will flow toward the canonical distribution. Now, probability distributions in classical statistical mechanics kind of translate in quantum statistical mechanics and thermodynamics into density operators. So it makes sense to think that the change in the density operator has something to, and also the density operator encodes our uncertainty about the system, say when we measure the system, and heat is random and so promotes uncertainty. So we can call this the rate at which heat is absorbed. So each definition has some pros and cons. I think that this definition has a pro of being intuitive. These have two different, quite different flavors. But on the other hand, definition has the con of not giving us information about single trials. And also, I don't know how practical this is measure. It's Sometimes not so bad if you're a theorist and you want to calculate these derivatives, but if you want to measure them, you might need a, a little more good fortune. Okay, it looks like we're at one minute to 10. So should I stop right at 10? Okay. There have been discussions this week about the measurement problem in quantum dynamics and single trials. And it's, it's maybe not a lot of problems, right? It's, you need an ensemble to look at it. 
Yeah, so is the question, is someone this week going to talk about the measurement problem specifically from a thermodynamic perspective? Okay. Is anyone going to talk about the measurement problem from a thermodynamic perspective? Okay. I think that when you watch the system, it's even better. But then you have to get some of the time. I would say that it's Yeah, no, no, it's fine. No, 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 it's, it's just this issue of uh, a single trial, a single trial and on theory, you get that you need, to, you need to get a wave function. You need yeah. to either you have to divide it to let go with the small system in the other way, yeah. or you need to do the smaller system. So this would be a content of any definition, right? Yes. So then, short answer is yes. Yes. Uh, both, right? and, yes. And there have been uh, a lot of different interesting approaches to the measurement problem of any quantum dynamics, for instance, over the past few years. Um, there was a revival of um, the, you know, the story of the big nurse friend paradox, yeah. um, really in the quantum foundations community, but a lot of people who address it. Miranda is also in the quantum dynamics community. Gabriel, are you going to talk about weak measurements at all? Continuous um, measurements. Okay, so kind of uh, one class of continuous measurements and weak measurements don't disturb the system very much, and that's actually. I think it's my last definition of quantum morphic peaks that I'm not going to get to. Um, but that's another solution. You can uh, measure the system gently so that you don't disturb it very much. On the other hand, you don't get so very much information out of the system because you don't correlate your device with it very strongly. Um, and you know, there's a whole formalism related to cross operators, involving cross operators for that. Um, so there are a number of different perspectives. Sorry. Oh, uh, questions are good. I would much rather talk about a question than what I had planned for next time. Um, so maybe I'll just list some of uh, list the other strategies. So we can find work in terms of battery. This is very operational. So we have some work storage device. The energy that goes in and comes out defines work. This has been used a lot in thermodynamic resource theories, and yeah, I'll. A little bit of clarification question here. You're getting the trade with respect to that. I agree. And now, this is just each of these is defined on the system of interest. So I'm assuming that the coupling to the bath is weak enough that there's a well defined Hamiltonian that also of interest. And yeah, we can measure the energy weakly so as not to disturb it very much. This is used. And for example, stochastic quantum thermodynamics and quantum optics. Um, but really, uh, every few months, I see on the archive a new paper in which somebody has solved the problem of quantum work and heat. They have the definitions that are good for everything. I think that defi different definitions are useful for different circumstances. And so maybe there's a kind of a lack of unification in quantum thermodynamics as opposed to saying particle physics, but I think that just makes quantum thermodynamics richer. Um, and also I can uh, maybe coordinate with Jacqueline to send out the rest of the lecture notes to everybody in case you want the, um, some of the map for these categories. So I think we have a break now. Excellent.